As far as uh, the week goes, this is a, a little bit of a bonus day for us. Um, so there's no real, um, you know, injury report per se, but um, be a couple of guys probably just resting still um, and then picking up the normal week Wednesday. Uh, Will, Will probably won't practice today. I know you guys will probably ask that. He probably won't practice today. Give him one more day uh, before he gets back into the weekly routine uh, on Wednesday. Um, and that should be uh, should be ready to roll. Uh, again, we'll, we'll stay tuned to any updates or changes, but uh, expect him to uh, be in the practice routine this week. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything else. We will we will open uh, Cedric Gray, uh, his his uh, return to play window this week. So that gives him three weeks to uh, for us to make a decision. So his window will open. He will start to practice. Uh, and other than that, that's about the it for injury, I think, unless I'm missing something. But that should be about it. So, so with Will, I guess, is this going to monitor him through the course of the week? Do you have you yeah. seen improvement since since last week? No, we'll see. I mean, he he did, he did a little treatment. Um, he was here for most of the most of the week and the weekend. Uh, he got out for a couple a day or two, like everybody else did. But um, yeah, he was he's in in the improving, um, and so we'll we'll see where he's at when we practice Wednesday. But uh, yeah, he's definitely better than he was, you know, after the game. Does his his situation kind of put you in a situation where you kind of where you were in the game, where if if things aren't going well. And his shoulder could conceivably be a factor, and it gives you an easy way to turn to Mason. Um, no, I mean I think if if he's good to practice and good to go, then then he's going to play. Um, and that's really, unless it's affecting his ability to do his job, um, I don't think that that'll be there'll be any discussion on that point. Um, Again, if it's if it still hurts a ton and he's having trouble throwing effectively and all those things, then yeah, that's a whole different conversation. But uh, again, we'll just see how the week of practice goes. Uh, but I feel pretty good about where he should be at. Hey, you, during the season, I, I know you and Clark are friends, but do you have do you have much time to like talk with him or hang out with him or see him much during the season? Yeah, I actually went over to his house last Saturday. <laughs> we were watching the Alabama game. I went over there and uh, visited with him for a little bit and and. I love I love bouncing things off him. I talk to him all the time. He's a uh, he's a great resource for me. He's been through a lot. Uh, he's done this job, uh, so he's he's great. And uh, I, you know I enjoy him and him and his family, and we enjoy hanging out together. Uh, so I went over there Saturday. We were watching the game. Uh, that was kind of our Friday, you know, before we left for Miami, and, and we were just joking. I was like, I, I actually went over to his office the morning of my interview here. The, I got the job, and then. I said, well, I went over to your house before I got off for my first win, so maybe there's something to it. Maybe we need to go hang out more often. So, yeah, I, I, not a lot. I mean, I, I, we text and I talked to him, but that was the first time I'd seen him this season so far. What would you tell him after the game on Saturday? Was that a text? Was that a call? And I just texted him. I'm sure he had a million texts and calls. But, yeah, I just said, what a, what a, what a win. What a, great, what a great performance by the team. Uh, what a cool atmosphere. I, just, I know how long he'd been working uh, for that kind of atmosphere, for that kind of win. Uh, what that means for that program it just it just i know i know what he's gone through and that's been really cool to to watch that build to this point and and hopefully they can keep it up for will do you know what kind of the feeling is the the, the maybe emotion for him right now in, in that shoulder and getting that ready for sunday yeah it's going to be a, a process during the week of getting getting comfortable i mean it's not going to be uh uh probably not going to be pain free i mean it's just the na nature of a throwing shoulder injury and um you know, you do your best to manage it, and as long as he feels he can do his job, then then he's going to go do it. And uh, yeah, it's it's going to be like every player right now; they're all dealing with something. Um, you know, some of it's more more impactful than others, but everyone's dealing with something they're playing through, and, and uh, he'll be playing through it. How much did he throw during the off week, and kind of what were the reports back from that? Uh, not much. I mean, it's a it was a full rest. Um, but you know he threw. He was he was throwing even like on the sidelines during the game. It just you just feel it. So the rest is hopefully where it improves pretty quickly. Um, and again, it's it's going to be something that he's going to be working through and dealing with. And as long as he he can do it effectively, then you know, like I said, he's like everybody else working through something. So um, as long as he can do his job. How much is there that could be learned for for Levis just from watching Mason Rudolph go through, kind of seeing it, believing it? Ripping it so quickly, mm -hmm. how much can you like go through and say, "Hey, look, see how he did this. This is what I want you to do." Yeah, I think there's anytime you watch another quarterback play, there's always something that you can learn from. Um, it's the same reason why I watch other teams around the league. I see how guys call games. I try to see where I can learn something too. So, anytime you get a chance to 
uh, point something out or somebody did something well. Um, it's not just a Mason thing. That's a, you know, quarterbacks around the league. There's we, we have a similar system to a handful of people. And um, so, yeah, you point those things out and you see if it can help you get, get your game a little bit better. Um, any tool that I can take to use to teach, I'll use. It's, I don't believe you've given up a pass over 40 yards this year. And whether it's Richardson or Flacco, it would seem, it would seem that the Colts are going to test that. Is, is no that doubt. something they like to do? Yeah, it's a, that's a really well-coached offense. Um, I've always been a, a fan of, of Shane. Um, Jim Bob Cooter as well as offensive coordinator. Those guys know what they're doing. They know how to get guys open. Um, they got the right players too. And, and to see the explosiveness they've had uh, really over the last two seasons, um, you know, you had to be on top of it because um, they're going to test you. They're going to test whether or not you're going to uh, be able to keep a roof on them. Um, and even if you can, they're going to find a way down the field. And uh, that's one of the things they've done well. And it's a, it'll be a challenge for us. This is probably the most uh, explosive offense that, that we've seen to date. Um, throughout this season so far and in terms of what they've done production wise. I mean, they've scored scored points and eight up yards and, and all those things. So um, I'm sure they feel similar to us that, you know, their, their two and three record isn't necessarily indicative of, of how well they played at certain parts of the year. And um, yeah, they're going to test us and then we got to be ready for that. You talked about um, <clears throat> maybe a willingness and necessity to be adaptable and willing to pivot based on what you learn about your team. Mm -hmm. In, in the self scouting you've done based on, on a quarter of, of your season, what what kind of pivots are you maybe willing or ready or need to make? Uh, there's a couple of things I think. A lot of it more is just things that I can probably do better. Um, uh, certain calls and certain spots. Um, it's really more. It, it's a small sample size at this point. Still, you know, you'd love to have six, seven games behind it, but. Um, yeah, but through four games, there's definitely things that I think we can improve on, um, some things that I can do better to help our offense. Uh, there's a couple of schematic things that you, you shift around and tweak and maybe try to lean into more. Obviously, not going to tell you those things at this moment. But, um, yeah, we, we feel pretty good about what we learned about our team through the first month and uh, what direction we're going to head from here. I, I feel pretty good about it. How important is it to when you talk about improving the drop back passing game and just any elements of that. How important is it to actually kind of lean into the run game while doing that and making sure the defenses have to focus on that and you have similar success to what you had in Miami? Yeah, I mean, I thought we ran the ball well in that game. I think we were physical. Um, that's that's one of the strengths of our team currently is, is our physicality up front uh, in the run game. Um, so those are things that we're gonna, we have to lean into. Um, and, and you hope that that opens up all the things that go along with it, with the play action game and the, and the action screens and um, helps the protection a bit. So it's not just a drop back pass fest and, and the, off the defensive line has to play a little more honest and has to respect the fact that the ball will get run. Um, but yeah, th those are things that I think that we've, we've done well um, and things that, you know, if you can balance your, you know, we've been pretty balanced, um, but all of the, the ability to be physical up front helps over the course of a game, especially when you in the spots where you do need to drop back, uh, there's some there's some carryover and benefit to those things when you run on the ball well. Last week, you, you said that Keandre Coburn could miss one to two more games. Did you learn anything else about kind of where he's at over the bye? Uh, no, I, I, that's that timeline probably hasn't changed at this point. We'll know more this week. What kind of value do you find in, in scoreboard watching or talking about the standings with the team this early in the season, especially with this first division game? Does that matter or is that Yeah, I think it matters. Um, you know, I, I, we put those things up. You know, we're aware of it. For us especially, you sort, of, you sort of take a quarterly look, you know, every four games or so on where things stand. And, um, you know, our focus when the week starts is very narrow. You know, we're trying to win this week. Uh, it's a week-to-week -week league, so what you did last week doesn't mean you're going to be able to repeat it this week, and all those things change. Um, however, there is a 30,000-foot view that I think helps guys put it in perspective that um, – yeah, we're we're our record is what it is. We we got we're one and three, but uh, you got a chance to quickly get back in the in the mix if you can win a divisional game this week. Um, you see, most of the league outside of about three teams is either three and two or two and three, uh, or two and two. So it's all jumbled up. Um, it, it's a you focus so much on your own team and your own process that every now and again though it does does help to get some perspective of what happens around the league and where teams stand and where your division stands and where the AFC stands and, and just to show that there's, you know, this is it's pretty wide open still at this point. And, and a lot of things can go a lot of different directions at, the, at this juncture in the season. But yeah, I think you, you always have a, an awareness of what is happening, particularly in your division and certainly in the conference.
when you look at your record and, and you see your 0 2 at home, that, that, that's got to be one of the first things you want to get corrected, isn't it? Take, take care of your home field. Yeah, you want to win at home. Um, you know, that would be that would be one of the things that you, you know, you you'd like to finish the season in your 6 and 2 or 7 and 1 at home. That's that's ideally what you'd love to have. Um, because that there is, you know, playing on at home is a big deal and uh, putting a product on the field that people want to come watch is also a part of it. And and you win games and more people come. Uh, you want to make it an environment that's difficult for other teams to play in. And um, there is an advantage to to playing at home when you have the the crowd behind you. And again, we got to do a better job of giving them something to be excited about for these home games, but um, that's just part of it. And you want to make sure that when you you are in your home schedule and you're doing things the right way, that you're winning those home games. It's an important part of the process because it's it's difficult to go win on the road. Um, but yeah, I, I would love for I would love for our, our home record to be better than it is, and it's it need, it's going to need to be over the rest of the season uh, if we want to if we want to be in the mix. And um, you know, disappointing thus far, but a chance for us to rebound this week. I, I could be wrong, but. And some of your opening scripted drives, it looks like the tight ends have been a relevant part of those. Have they stayed as big a part of it as they need to be, or do they need to be more involved for, for four quarters? Probably the latter. I mean, there's definitely things that I can use those guys better. Um, those are things that, that I've, you know, as I look at how games have unfolded and where calls came in and what kind of calls were made, uh, those are things that I can help uh, that process, and I can get those guys a part of the action a little more. Um, they've done a really nice job. You know, they've – They've been productive when called upon, and, and you know I, I like that group, and I think that they can continue to help us. What did the bye week process kind of look like for, for Jeff? I know he has the mm -hmm. elbow that he's dealing with. Uh, how did he go about managing that? Well, same as the rest of the guys that are in. You know, they, they get their treatment. They make sure they're taking care of what they got to take care of. Um, and they, you try to let them still get a day or two out, out, out and – you know, you only get a, one of these <laughs> over the course of 17 games, so um, take the rest when it's when it's provided, and um, everything else seems good. Uh, he'll be, you know, he'll be working through his that elbow injury this week, and and we'll see where he stands. But uh, hopeful that he's ready to roll. For you, is that, is that, is that like as you watch him, like is that kind of like a pain tolerance? Is there concern that it could actually get worse, or how do you approach it? Uh, it's really up to him. These guys know their bodies and our training staff. You know, I don't, I'm not the doctor on those things, and they they rely on those opinions and. Um, Again, everything everything that we had prior to and at this point is that it's uh, it needed a little bit of time to heal and that it would be better in, in a week's time, be better in two weeks' time, and that was the the genesis behind the decision to, to sit him on Monday night is that um, he'd be able to in, in really two weeks' time from the from the the injury would be a much better spot. So ultimately, that's where we landed on it uh, because it would be in his best interest to for longevity's case to keep him out. The bye gives you a chance to get healthy and also do some of that self-scouting. You said mm -hmm. maybe helpful if you've got a few more games of tape for some of that self-scouting to figure out your identity, but with sort of the injuries stacking up and the way the first four weeks have gone, do you think this came at the right time for your team? I think so. It, you know, you don't really control it. I mean, it's they give you the bye when they give you the bye, and uh, you try to make the most of it whenever it is. This is probably the earliest I've had one. I, I don't remember having one at week five. It's, that's early. Um, but probably the appropriate one for us, you know, a month into the season, uh, get a chance to really see what, what we've done over the first four weeks, where we need to get better. Uh, certainly a lot of things to improve upon. Um, and the injuries are a part of it. You know, we've been relatively healthy. Um, but, yeah, there's certainly guys that, that needed, the, needed the time. And, um, again, we'll take it whenever they give it to us. And, you know, again, earlier than I would have hoped. But I think we made the most of it. When you look at the passing game and specifically those top three wide receivers who I'm sure you'd love to get the ball in their hands mm -hmm. more than you have to this point. How much of that is the offense coming together, maybe the balance you talked about earlier, and how much maybe within the self-scout can you identify certain ways that you are literally giving them the ball, so to speak? Yeah, that's that's really where I look at it. It's, it's more from my end than anything else is how do I continue to make sure those guys are getting targeted um, early enough in the game too where they can help make an impact and sort of get, there's a, a rhythm involved and, a, and a, uh, you know, guys like to touch the ball early. Uh, so you just find ways to make sure that at least they're the primary. Now, again, you, you, you can't necessarily control where the ball goes all the time, but um, you can control at least with the play calls that you're, you're trying to get a certain spot. And it's not Will's responsibility to try to get the ball to guys, it's mine. Um, and so I call the plays with the intent. 
uh, and then as Will just sees and reacts to what he sees. But um, yeah, the, you know, I think that's the that's area we could definitely serve to be improved in is, is the drop back game and um, finding ways to get those guys more involved than they've been. It's the you know our pass game production is not where uh, it needs to be for us to continue to to try to win you know enough ball games to to be in the hunt and um, you know that's one of the things that we we took a long look at. Why do you, why do you think you pass the drop back is is the element that's having the most trouble? Uh, I think you're dealing with um, a, a mix of, of playing some pretty solid fronts early in the season with a young line um, that was coming along. And so I think we've given up more pressure than we'd like to give up. That affects the passing game. Um, you get into some spots like in the Green, Green Bay game where now you're in, they know you're passing it. Um, it ends up being a, a, a feast uh, when those things happen. So uh, it's it's probably just a conglomeration of, of a week-to-week things that were, were good and bad. Um, I mean, not enough probably sample size to really feel strongly one way or the other, but um, it's a, it's a it's a combination of of the pass protection, of um, decision making at quarterback, and uh, our ability um, to put guys in the right spot. So it's sort of a three pronged approach, I, and I take probably more of the blame of it than anything. Is just keep finding ways to make that better for us. Um, but yeah, there's it's got to improve for sure for us to to continue to try to win games. How much of that do you think is just league wide passing? Down. Uh, I think it was down early, but I think it's picked back up. Um, you, you know, I think these offenses have sort of found their groove and started their. You, you're seeing the improvement across the league of you know guys again, whatever their situations may be, new quarterbacks, new players, all those things. As as they play together, it starts to uh, figure itself out to some degree. Um, so I think that's what's happening around the league now. I think you're seeing you know there's an uptick in scoring and an uptick in, in passing and all those things, and hopefully we're going to be we'll be in that same group too. Um, but you, you definitely find it more out about your team, and, and guys are getting more comfortable playing football. And it, the passing game lagged a little bit this year, but I think it's right back. It'll, I think when we look at it at the end of the year, it'll be right back to where it always is. Nick Petit Frere uh, solidify his spot at right tackle, or are you still looking there? Yeah, I mean, he played pretty good Monday night. Um, again, it was a you know he didn't get put in harm's way too often. We we ran the ball pretty much the whole second half. Um, but yeah, I mean that's that's to me that's going to be a, a week to week thing, and and he keeps he needs to play well, and he can keeps playing well, and we'll keep competing. Um, you know, I don't want to put any parameters on that because you know we'll, we'll see. I guess is the best way to put it. Good. Thank you, Brian. You want me to introduce? Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have a, being the uh, the crucial catch uh, time of the year for us. Uh, we're going to bring in uh, Ramonda Jordan. Uh, Randy Jordan's wife um, to speak a little bit about her journey. Uh, she was was diagnosed. I don't know. I'll let her tell the timeline, but I think within the last probably the last year, I think roughly, uh, with breast cancer, uh, and has been through a whole uh, a whole fight um, that's pretty inspiring. So a chance for her to share her story, and, and hopefully, um, you know, for the people that are going through it, uh, something that can inspire them as well. But it's it's been an incredible story. I've known we've known the Jordan family for a really long time. Um, and just to see, you know, what what this what what the fight looks like, the toll it takes on people, um, you know, I just think it'd be an inspiring story to hear from from Manja uh, about her journey and what it's been like um, to to fight that fight. And so, without further ado, I'll why don't you come on up, Ramonda? Good to have you here. Good morning. I just want to um, thank you all for having me. My name is Ramonda Jordan. Um, uh, my husband is uh, Coach Randy Jordan, and I'm just excited, and it's such a privilege to be here to talk to you today about um, and be a part of uh, the NFL initiative, the Crucial Catch, and why it's so important to me. Um, so we talked about, I'll just let you know a little bit about, um, you know, prior to my diagnosis, you know, during that and, and where things stand with that now. Um, but I'm really just here um, to let people know that the early detection and all the things that we say about cancer, they're not just buzzwords. Those are really things that can um, save lives and have a huge impact on what the future of so many um, people look like. And especially for me, um, just starting out to let you know a little bit, you know, about my journey. Um, you know, I started out, you know, many years ago, um, uh, you know, breast cancer and anything dealing with uh, women and children's um, health issues has always been important to me. So over the years and all of the different stops and teams, um, you know, doing so many initiatives with, uh, you know, Race for the Cure and uh, just 
uh, uh, many of the um, cancer, you know, did a lot with St. Jude's, obviously that deals with children, but it's always had a special place in my heart. So um, dealing with the breast cancer um, was important to me because of my family. Um, my mom comes from a big family of 11, so I'd always uh, been very um, proactive and, you know, voicing a lot of opinion about everybody, you know, do your monthly checks, you know, early detection, how important it is. And, you know, oddly enough, after, you know, probably being involved in, in organizing walks and leading and um, just advocating for breast cancer, my mom was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer and she actually, um, 10 years later after that, she beat cancer twice. And so still as you're, um, you know, going through it um, and being the support and also being a caregiver, um, you know, sometimes it really just doesn't, you know, hit you. Um, it hits you in a different way, you know, when it impacts you. So through, um, you know, the work with the different teams, um, through my, um, the co-founder of Off the Field, which is the NFL Wives Association, um, that's really what we just try to do, continue to amplify, um, amplify that. But it's interesting because, um, you know, I learned firsthand um, when we talk about we don't want people to walk alone. You know, if you, you know, my first thing is early detection and screening and try to save those um, people from even being in that position. But, um, you know, as we all know, life, you know, has its own playbook and it gives you different things that you don't know are coming. Um, but when that time does come, you know, having a support system, um, you know, having the right care team in place are critical. And then having that, um, one of the things that my doctors um, talked to me about was like, hey, get your village together and get that team together. And that's how I approached it. Um, you know, went out and uh, talked to people, whether they be people I've known um, all the way from middle, high school, college, um, my support and care team that um, I was uh, diagnosed with uh, stage three breast cancer in June of uh, 2023. And I'm just so thankful for all the people that rallied, um, you know, with me um, from my husband's players and um, our former team. And, and the Titans have been um, just amazing because, um, you know, Randy got here in February and from day one, um, you know, we say that football is family, but um, knowing the support, um, you know, uh, Coach Callahan, I, Randy, I guess February the 8th, um, he became a Titans coach and probably about, I think about not even two weeks later, I was having a double mastectomy and uh, the Titans were stepping in to give me the support, um, you know, that I needed, and especially with it being afar. So it's just really critical, um, you know, not only for me, but just for people to know um, either the dynamics of a, you know, a cancer journey is not just, you know, to get you to the end until you're cancer free. There's a lot of different things. And as I'm saying this to you, you know, I know it firsthand because I'm, you know, still going through it and you still have to be on top of it, still have that care team. And I would just say that if you do um, have to go through it, I would just um, encourage you to be an advocate for your own health. Learn as much as you can, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, not necessarily to challenge, but just to make sure that you're not looked at as a number um, or a statistic, but that your care team is um, locked in on you as a person. And, you know, all the different things in your environment, your background are what are going to shape, you know, your journey and your outcome. And so, I mean, I just think that's really critical to have that in place. So I'm just, again, just excited to be a part um, of a crucial catch because the, the hope is that we can give people um, although you may go through it and get through it and fight through it, um, what does that journey look out um, at the end? And you want that to be positive, um, that you can do it and you can do this, you can get through it. And so I just encourage any of those Titan fans out there, you know, we're Titans, we're warriors, um, you know, whatever it is that you're facing, um, you know, just get your team around you. Um, you know, I believe in the power of prayer. That has definitely been uppermost um, in my journey. And, um, you know, just get ready to battle and just know that, um, you know, take it one day at a time and, you know, and that they'll get through it. So um, I'm just really excited to be here, you know, for that. Thank you. When you get the diagnosis, I mean, that's obviously a traumatic moment. 
how hard is it to reach out to your team instead of wanting to keep it to yourself? Um, you know, really, it, it was never really a question of whether I would. Um, I just had to be very mindful. It did take me um, some time to think about, not necessarily my team, um, you know, of supporters. I mean, you know, you know, like I said, I guess I look at things in a way of, um, I know what the outcome, you know, I'm like, I've got to beat this thing. You know, I have a family that I love, you know, you know, a life to live. And so I will already kind of focus in on the end of it. And I think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, my mom is a, um, 24 year military veteran in the Air Force. And when she was diagnosed, you know, although it was difficult, you know, people, you're going to go through emotions and, you know, um, you know, you're human. But I think I drew strength in watching, you know, how she, you know, dealt with it. And, and so it allowed me, um, because I remember the words that I gave her, hey, you can't close off. You got to, you know, reach out, let people help you. And we're kind of go getters and like to do things, um, you know, for ourselves. And I think that's one of the biggest lessons, uh, learning to rely on other people. And incredible things can happen, you know, for you when you do that. Um, and, you know, most, a lot of the messages that I received when I did reach out were like, man, you're always here for us. We just want to be here for you. And a little bit of a funny story, whenever I um, had talk, talked to my doctor, um, when, you know, they were the ones that said, get your team together. and um, you know, I talked to her about when she told me that I was going to have chemo for five months. It wasn't like I was just like, oh, great, you know, let's go. But um, I think you have those moments when um, like the weight of it is on you. But then you give yourself that time to have the weight and then you plan. And so from there, I um, my uh, my uh, college roommate, my best friend sent out um, you know, a note to people and saying, hey, this is what we've got to do. These are the dates. And it was so funny because it filled up, you know, so fast that people were texting me on the side like, hey, who's this person here? She's got three days. You know, I want to come in and, and do help. So, I mean, that's definitely a blessing. And I understand, um, understand that everyone doesn't, um, may always have that support. And so that's why I like to advocate um, for people to, you know, just make sure you understand that people don't need to walk alone. But, um, you know, it was um, easy enough to reach out because I knew they would be there, but also easy enough to reach out because I um, also feel like um, you're, al you're always um, can be a light to other people, even in darkness. And so I, for me, and this is just a personal thing, and that's one of the things, everybody's journey is different. And so they have to handle it in the best way for them to get through. So the best way for me to get through um, was to practice what I preached, you know, to others. And I would never want to see someone else go through that and feel like they had to hide it under a bush because, you know, people expect for you to be strong or for whatever different reasons. Um, that people choose to do that. But then I also understand people have different personalities and they might need to kind of shut and power down. You know, me, I, you know, I, I needed that light because, of, you know, people are my energy and, you know, they are the ones that I knew would, would help um, bring me through. And they, you know, and they still are because I'm still, um, you know, just to be really transparent, um, you know, why um, I think it's important to remind people of that it's a, you know, it's a journey, you know, it's not like this race you're going to win and then it might be over because I, uh, I'm going to be in a, for five years, you know, be under the care of an oncologist. Um, as a matter of fact, I need to find the best one in Nashville, you know, to be on my team now. Um, you know, my numbers are up and so they're always, you know, looking like, okay, we have to be careful. We have to see, you know, like, why are these numbers up? And so, you know, it's a, um, like I said, it's a, a race that you may not finish as quickly as you want, but putting the right team around you, I think, is, uh, is critical. And you're you. proud, proud of a husband like that. You know, you know, you know. He's a boss. <laughs> 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 you go okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned your mom. What was Randy, what's Randy been like for you as far as uh, trying to, to lift you and, and your, you know, your family? Now you, you said my mom, but did you yeah, say yeah, Randy? Yeah, what's Randy been like, I guess, through all of this? Oh, I mean, he's he's been awesome. I mean, we, um, you know, we celebrated 30 years of marriage, 
um, in June. Um, and, you know, you never know what you're going to go through, but I think, um, you know, that's always been a thing of ours is that, you know, no matter what it is, you know, we can do it as long as we stick together. And, you know, all of you know, um, you know, in this world of sports and, you know, especially with football, you know, schedules are, you know, are pretty, you know, intense. And so I think, you know, for him, um, the most difficult thing is that he wanted to walk through like every moment um, that he could. But just like, you know, I told him, you know, as well as my kids, I mean, for me, um, going through that, because I was blessed enough to have that support system around and, um, you know, because I was going to uh, chemo and needed somebody there with me weekly. When I went into radiation, I had to have somebody there with me uh, daily for about, you know, for about a month. Then, um, then I'm like, hey, you can just do what you do. Um, and I know that if I need you, um, you know, I had, um, you know, a coach and Coach Rivera at the time um, that understood because of his battle with breast cancer. Um, and that you can be there. I'll let you know when I like, I really need you to be there. So um, it's been, um, it's been emotional. I think not just, you know, with Randy, you know, with my kids, um, you know, anybody when they're going, you know, facing a battle, you know, like your care team, people are affected in different ways. You know, they may not be the one going through it, but they're going to be affected. And so, um, you know, I think it was pretty natural what he went through to feel like, um, he didn't have as much time as he wanted, but um, but I understood that and we embraced it and we um, just found a way to fight, you know, together, so. Where are you now in your battle with it? You said it's a five year process with your oncologist or you're a year into that or how? Yeah, no, so I am, I finished radiation. Um, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm still, like I said, it's a, it's a lot longer process than I thought whenever it started out. Um, I finished radiation in May um, and then um, I will have my hopefully last surgery, um, not until after this season. So we still have some things um, to go through. Um, as far as we call it, um, I'm cancer free. But like I said, I do have elevated levels that we need to, you know, to check out. So, I mean, it's there are um, the one thing about um, that I have learned is is that there are so many things that we don't talk about which are, you know, the side effects of that. Um, we don't talk about, um, not necessarily in my case, but it was such an eye opener in terms of just the cost, um, you know, that it takes. And it can be so devastating, um, you know, to families to, you know, have to shoulder that. And so that's one of the things when I can, um, you know, have more time to, I gotta take care of myself, but to focus on, that's something that I would really like to, um, get into is to figure out how, um, why is it that way, and, and you know what can we do um, as far as insurance, or what can we do to um, you know be a support? Because the, the the main thing is you know when they tell you to um, you got to focus in on your health, you know you know minimize the stress, do all those things. Um, when people are, I mean, I remember the first time I saw a bill for. I don't know that it was supposed to come directly to me, but to see that to, for me to sit in the chair for one session of chemo was like $15,000. And it's just like, you know, that that's, you know, that, and, you know, obviously if you have insurance, then that takes off some of that burden. But there are a lot of people that go through this that don't have either the best insurance or they have no insurance. And so it's just like, man, how can you really focus, you know, on getting better when all you can think about is if I get to the end of this, then it's a devastation, you know, in life financially or just what have you. So, um, you know, it's it's a, I guess it can be a catch-22, you know, like you get better, but you have things. And for me, I have, um, you know, some things we don't talk about, you know, like neuropathy or, or lymphedema or some of the things that I'm going to have to do daily um, to deal with from here on out. But the you know, but the hopeful and the best thing is that I'm cancer free and I get to do those things. So I kind of look at it in that way.